Coming up on Car Advice this week, the Takata Airbag Recall. Find out how many dangerous cars are currently on Australian roads and also find out whether your car could potentially kill you in a minor car accident. The new Mercedes-Benz A-Class does the incredible class-leading infotainment signal a new direction for Mercedes-Benz tech focus. And the best cars under $100,000. Figure out which car you should lash out on this bonus season. Welcome to Car Advice. Thanks for joining us. It's been a busy week at Car Advice HQ. We're going to take a look at some of the big issues in automotive. We've got the Takata airbag scandal. That is still rolling along, believe it or not. We're going to take a closer look at the new Mercedes-Benz A-Class, very important vehicle for that brand in Australia. And we're going to tell you about the best cars under $100,000. Joining me at the desk, my partner in crime, Paul Marrick. How are you, mate? Good, mate. Now, first up, Jaguar have announced a five-year warranty. So pop out the streamers and the fireworks, uh, why should we care? Mate, we should care because it's about time some of these premium manufacturers started giving up That's a bit true. more time. And at the end of the day, this car is important for Jaguar. It's called the I-Pace, it's fully electric, yep. and it's going to compete with cars like the Model X. How much is it going to cost us? That's the big question. It, what's it going to cost? And also, what does this mean for infrastructure? Because the money's one thing. The government really hasn't gotten on board with charging infrastructure. So what's Jaguar going to do about that to encourage people to buy this thing? So pricing starts from $119,000 plus on-road costs. And look, to me, it's, it's not up to the government to help manufacturers yeah, roll out point. infrastructure, yep. especially when the cars are this expensive. It's not helping everyday consumers. So Jaguar's taken some initiative here. They're dropping $4 million on rolling out infrastructure around Australia. And they're also going to give new owners three years of free charging, which yep. is pretty good. That's pretty good. We're going to take a closer look at things like charging infrastructure and electric vehicles in a later episode, because I think that's really important. Yep. Uh, how quick is this thing? Because the electric cars are pretty fast, generally. Yeah, absolutely. I had the chance to do the... Uh, international launch we're talking about zero to 100 kilometers an hour in under five seconds yeah that's quick so this isn't a buzz box that you'll need to get a run up at the traffic lights for it is blisteringly fast and you can take it to a racetrack as well and for me i think the message out of this mate i'm sure you agree with me on this is that this could be the stepping stone for luxury manufacturers manufacturers that charge a lot of money for their cars to start offering longer warranties to match lesser brands like Hyundai and Kia. Well, mate, if they can do it with cheaper cars, lower margins, it's about time that these other manufacturers started stepping up. Absolutely. Look, let's move along to Ford Ranger Raptor. This is an incredibly important vehicle for the brand in Australia. Uh, number one and two in Australia, Hilux and, and Ranger. So, you know, dual cab utes flying off the shelves. You've driven this thing. First of all, tell me a little bit about why we should be excited about it. See that smile? <laughs> That's the Ranger Raptor smile. Yeah. Uh, and this car is incredible. Designed, engineered right here in Australia. So it is very much an Australian product. Uh, we're talking about $75,000 plus your on-road So that costs. wasn't the smile of someone who's about to spend 75 grand on <laughs> no, a dual No, it's not. No, right. And it okay. is short on a couple of safety features, but if you put that stuff to the side, yep. this car is incredible. It will do jumps. It has mm. some pretty impressive Fox Racing suspension. Uh, it is down on towing capacity, but this car is designed for the weekend warrior who wants to go off-road <laughs> and tackle any type of terrain. Now, look, if you want to see what we think about the Ranger Raptor, go to caradvice.com and you can have a look at Paul's video and our reviews on the car and what we think about it as a vehicle so that's what it's about I think the most important thing with this vehicle globally is how many markets this is going to go to because you mentioned local engineering before yeah. this vehicle was designed and engineered in Australia there are rumors it might go to North America but we've had it confirmed that it's going to Europe and that's a big deal it is huge because this car will go out to hundreds of markets and it means that it's an important product for Ford in that sense globally yeah it is only currently confirmed with one engine, a two-litre diesel. That's not going to cut it for the American market. So I suspect down the track we'll <laughs> see a V6 petrol with a turbo. Bigger That'd diesel cool. maybe as well? Potentially, but they have ruled it out. We have interviewed them about this and they ruled out a bigger diesel. So I think the petrol is, is the kicker. Yeah. And if it is offered in the States, it's highly likely that that will then come back to Well, Australia. it's the same platform, isn't yeah. it? It makes sense. And I, and I don't think there's any indication that dual cab ute sales are going to slow down anytime no. soon. Default family vehicle. JD Power, Paul, what is it? Explain to the viewers what JD Power is. Yeah, you'll hear us talking about this often, and it's a company that does international marketing surveys, and they will survey a customer in terms of reliability of the cars, and in this case, they've had a look at what a car is like after the sales purchase. 
because you know your salesman can be all nice yeah. and chummy, but then when you come back to have the car serviced, yeah. what's the point if it's not a good experience? Well, this is the big news. That's that's the fact there about. Most people do their research, buy a car, and they see that as the end point. Um, it's actually the starting point because after you buy the car, you then own it for five to seven years, and that's where this comes into play. The big news is that Mazda have won their third straight JD Power survey in Australia. So clearly Mazda is doing something right about looking after and retaining customers once they've purchased the Mazda. Yeah, no, and, and this is the thing. Mazda is kicking some goals at the moment, so they've done a five-year warranty. They're also rolling out CarPlay across the range. It's retrofittable. But the servicing experience, my yeah. wife drives a Mazda. Whenever she goes you in don't. to get it... No, I you will, yeah, exactly. Uh, whenever it goes in to get serviced, they don't treat her like an idiot. And this is the key thing. If you know you have to pay to have your car serviced, you don't want to have your pants pulled down when you go to the dealership and then have to give them money to yeah, service the car. Yeah, more money, exactly. And look, Toyota have had a reputation in Australia for many, many years now about being unbreakable. Mm -hmm. They have issues just like every other car company, but the key with Toyota for me, and my family's owned a lot of Toyotas over the years, is how they fix these issues when they crop up. So Toyota has always had that extensive dealer network. I think now we're seeing brands like Mazda looking at what Toyota's done historically in Australia and saying, we have to look after our customers in order to retain them because the dealership experience in Australia, it's struggling at the moment, isn't it? Dealers are doing it tough. They are doing it really tough, but... On that same token, Toyota, let's catch up, guys. Mm. Three-year warranty. Yeah. So if they're unbreakable, give them a warranty. Absolutely. Yep. Catch up with the rest of the people. Absolutely. Now, Takata Airbags, Paul, this is a huge deal. Uh, every time we write about it on the website, every time we have video, radio shows that we do, everybody wants to know what it's about, whether their cars are affected. Mm. So we'll look at all that in a minute. It's a big issue that the manufacturers need to be taking seriously. It's a big issue that the government needs to be taking seriously. We'll have a look at a suggestion you've made that I think is a really clever one regarding that, that governments could uh, take the front foot on. But first of all, explain to the viewers what the problem is because people's first reaction is, oh, my airbag's going to explode or, you know, it's not going to work in an accident. What exactly is the problem that we need to get fixed? So, Trent, we've got two types of bad airbags and they're all manufactured by a company called Takata. Yep. Takata supplied airbags to almost every manufacturer in the world, everything from, uh, f you know, Holden's yeah. right through to Ferrari's. Yeah. A lot of cars are affected here. And what's happening is that the Alpha airbags, they have two types, Alpha and Beta. Yeah. Alpha airbags after around six years become potentially lethal. And what they're saying is that after six years exposed to various climates and humidity, these airbags have a 50-50 chance of killing you mm. in a minor accident. Yeah. And we're talking about over 20 deaths worldwide, one in Australia, and the one in Australia was such a minor accident that if it wasn't for the airbag going off, they would have just walked away from it. And that's the point too. If you guys are watching this thinking about whether you're going to take it seriously or not, airbags can deploy at quite low speed. Uh, this is why we're saying to everybody, and if you go to caradvice.com, you'll see we've written there, get this fixed and find out whether your vehicle's affected because it can happen at such a low speed. This is not a massive impact. This is not 150 or 200 yeah. kilometres an hour. It's quite minor. Um, when these airbags degrade, what's the next step that the manufacturers can take to fix it? Because there's a lot of vehicles affected, which we'll look at in a minute, the number of vehicles that have been affected. But what do manufacturers have to do? Because Takata went into administration yeah. and went bankrupt not long after. Yeah. So the company that would have needed to re, you know, supply the airbags to replace the damaged ones was no longer in a position to do that. Yeah. So where do we go from here in that sense? Right, so Takata's been bought out by another company, but they haven't yeah. taken on any of the liabilities. What manufacturers are doing now is getting Takata airbags and fitting them to cars that are affected. I know it sounds completely ridiculous, yeah. but if you do have a Takata airbag, they're taking that one out and fitting it with another, and some people will actually have to have another airbag replacement. In five to seven years. That's right. So they, they work within the span of around, of around six years. The beta airbags are, are far more safe, so you don't need to worry about that. It is a one-hour process, so when you do take your car in to have it fixed, if it is affected, it's a one-hour process. In Australia, we're talking about 1.8 million cars that still need fixing. Mm. Only 1.1 million have been replaced. Uh, globally, 100 million cars. This is the biggest recall of its kind anywhere in the world. Absolutely. And if you have a look at the ACCC website, um, over the past 12 months alone, 1.1 million faulty Takata airbags have been replaced in around 930,000 mm. Australian vehicles. So this is a big deal in Australia, just even for our small market. For this many vehicles to be affected is a huge deal. Um, 
You had a suggestion, uh, I, I think we spoke about it on radio originally, about what the government or the local state governments yep. could do to prevent this being an issue. Because in our opinion, the car advice uh, way of looking at this is that it has to be fixed. There are no ifs, buts or maybes. Manufacturers need to fix this problem and they need to get on the front foot. So we'll have a look at how you find out if your vehicle is affected in a second. But your suggestion was what specifically that the governments could do if your vehicle wasn't repaired. Okay, so here's the situation, right? Uh, my wife's car, for example, it's a Mazda 2. The passenger airbag was a Takata airbag that needed to be fixed. Yep. If she chose not to get it fixed and was carrying a passenger around, they would have no idea what the problem is and you're potentially risking the life of someone. So to, to compel people to have these things fixed, what I think you should do, mm. get this, sit down. Yeah, um, I am. Car, I mean, we should be able to go to each authority in Victoria, New South Wales, mm. Tasmania, etc. They have a list of VIN numbers that yep. is a vehicle identification number. It's unique to your car. Mm -hmm. If your car is affected when it comes to registration time, if you have not had it fixed, guess what? You don't have registration. Yep. Guess what? If you drive your car, you have no insurance. Mm -hmm. So it is quite serious. To me, I mean, the, unless there's something more to this, this could be implemented within an hour. It mm -hmm. is a simple database Pretty search. Yep. So we could fix this problem almost immediately. Why the government hasn't done it is absolutely beyond me. Some car manufacturers are going to lengths of hiring people to go and door knock. So Mazda had mm. employed people to go and door knock customers that weren't responding yep. to them asking them to come in. And you guys might think to yourself, why would you would not take this seriously? Well, there are people driving around on bald tyres. There are people driving around with <laughs> disc brakes that you know are almost worn through yep. or brake pads that are worn through. So a lot of car owners don't take these things seriously. The other issue that I think is Australia-wide and all, also global is that a lot of these vehicles are now second, third, fourth, yep. fifth hand. So it, it's one thing for Mazda, for example, to be able to chase you if you bought the vehicle a certain amount of years ago and you still own it. But it's when you go through two, three, four, five different owners, yep. that's when it becomes difficult. Now, at Car Advice, we've set up a way in which people can find out whether their vehicle is affected. How do they do that? Just head to the Car Advice website. We have all the details there. It will take you literally five seconds yep. to check whether your car's affected. You put your registration number in, it will tell you if you're affected and the steps you need to take to get it fixed. It is a very quick process. We urge you to do that. Even if you have had it checked previously, yep. these lists are updating very frequently. So please just go to the effort and check again. And please take this seriously. Don't let it slip. Get on the Car Advice website, use the vehicle selector, find out whether your vehicle is affected and book it in and get it fixed. <laughs> The 2019 Mercedes-Benz A-Class, this is a vital vehicle for the brand in Australia, Paul. You've driven it. If you want to go and have a look at Paul's video, go to caradvice.com, use the vehicle selector, you'll find it there. I had a quick look at some of the technology within this car earlier before you drove it uh, at the SEMA show in Las Vegas. We'll get to that tech in a minute because it's incredibly impressive. But what did you think having driven it? Tell me a little bit about the car itself because that's yeah. the main thing. Mate, I was super excited about this because... I don't know, I'm younger than you <laughs> than at least. Me? And yeah, um, it's a car that appeals to me, certainly mm. from, from its design and tech perspective. We're talking about a car that starts in Australia from 47200 yeah. So it's bucks. affordable. Yeah. There is a cheaper one coming early next year and the all-wheel drive performance version coming later this year. But it does mean that consumers are getting into a car that has a load of tech, a fuel-efficient engine, and it's fun to drive as well. Right, so the driving is the main part of it. But I think for me, the interesting thing about the A-Class now... Uh, is the philosophy that Mercedes-Benz have brought to this vehicle. Because what they've done, for viewers who aren't familiar with this, what Mercedes-Benz normally does is they filter technology down from the S-Class backwards through the range. So from their most expensive vehicle, their highest tech vehicle, backwards down through the range. What they've done here with A-Class is started at the bottom of the range or the entry point and working their way up through. So this MBUX platform, the Mercedes-Benz user experience as it's known, is the centrepiece of the technology in this vehicle. So tell us a little bit about how that works. This will absolutely blow you away if you love tech. Even if you don't love tech, it's so easy to use. What you can say to the car is, hey, Mercedes, <laughs> and it does sound incredibly well, stupid. If you thought you sounded stupid, you know, picking these up and saying, hey, Siri, now you're saying, hey, Mercedes. Man. But with that command, you can ask the car to do anything. So it will open and close sun blinds. It will change your radio station. You can even change the colour in the car. So it is really cool stuff. From there, you even have technology that allows you to learn what the car is doing. So using your phone, you point it at the car mm. and it uses... Uh, it uses a feature that will display the car in front of you and then show you all the different points on the car. So you have an interactive manual 
right there in your phone. Yeah. It is incredible it's stuff. It's very handy. And look, I tested it, as I said, in Las Vegas, and it worked. So we did a predetermined drive route, and the vehicles were all uh, camouflaged up, so you couldn't see anything yeah. except the screens. And you say, hey, Mercedes-Benz, take me to the nearest Mexican restaurant, or hey, Mercedes-Benz, where's the closest dry cleaner? And it'll take you to those places mm. really accurately, it has to be said. I guess the bigger picture for this, though, is the whole issue of data security, because... Plenty of people have got issues with these, with yep. mobile phones and the fact that if you use an Apple like I do or you use an Android, that someone somewhere knows what you're doing, when you're doing it, what your routine is, yep. all that kind of stuff. Can we be any more um, content with Mercedes-Benz knowing all that than we can a phone <laughs> manufacturer? If you're worried about privacy, <laughs> don't buy this car. Right. Uh, but look, okay, this good. is the thing. It, it learns over a six-week pe six period what your, um, I guess, habits and traits yeah. are. So yeah. if you go to footy training on a Wednesday night, it will know that that should be at the top of your nav list. If you call your wife on the way home at 6 p.m., it will have her or his details mm. right at the top yep. of the list. So it's quite clever in that regard. But if you are concerned with privacy, mm. I mean, you almost have to sit at home these days and not <laughs> to go lock anywhere. yourself up. I, I guess the issue as well is Mercedes-Benz have told us that they have top shelf data encryption and security to keep this stuff um, safe once the vehicle knows what you're doing and once someone at head office knows what you're doing. Mercedes-Benz, like most of the manufacturers, have been aggressively hiring people out of Silicon Valley rather than from other motoring manufacturers. So this shows that sort of crossover between automotive and tech now that we're seeing, yeah. uh, where our vehicles are almost computers by default, you know? But at the end of the day, I mean, privacy yeah. and protection and encryption doesn't mean much when you throw a bunch of hackers yeah. at something. But look, to be honest, I don't really care if anyone knows what I'm doing. If it means it's more convenient for me as a driver, that's yeah. a good thing. Um, under the engine of this car, it uses a shared engine with Renault. And that's the thing I was going to ask you about. So shared platform with Renault. Tell us a little bit about that engine, what it feels like to drive in the suspension as well, because that's a big yeah. deal. So this, this is going to sound scary to most people, <laughs> but a 1.3 litre turbocharged engine. So yeah. it's a tiny, tiny little engine. Thing, yeah. You think to yourself, that's not going to have any get up and go. But we're talking about 120 kilowatts of power, 250 newton metres of torque. And newton metres are, of course, that feeling you yeah. get when when you get on the throttle. The only thing I didn't like about it is the gearbox. It uses a dual clutch gearbox and it can be a bit fidgety at times. And the other thing as well is they've now gone down the path of what we call torsion beam yeah. suspension. Now that's a slightly antiquated and much mm. cheaper way to implement suspension on a, on a smaller car like this. You can of course option independent rear suspension as well which definitely improves the ride. But I mean, that torsion beam stuff really could dilute the value of this as a, as a performance car. Well, I think it will, it will hurt the entry-level models in terms of the way they feel and the way that they ride. That's something to note. But I guess Mercedes-Benz would be doing it for financial reasons, yep. as most manufacturers do. The question is, if you're buying an A200 and your entry point into the range, are you more focused on the tech or are you more focused on the way it drives? The performance fans are going to be asking about things like A250 and then ultimately A45. Oh, can't wait for that. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, they're the ones that people are going to be interested in. When are we going to expect to see them in Australia? Look, A200, which is uh, the current model, is going to be supported by the A180 early next year, A250 later this year. A45 is yet to be announced, but that thing, if the current one is anything to go by, will be an absolute rocket ship. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, you know, high performance hatch, really. It's, it's yeah. you know, another level entirely. Uh, if you're interested in the A-Class, go to caradvice.com and have a look. As I said, Paul's got a video there. But I think this vehicle signals the start of a new era for automotive and tech and the way that they converge. Paul, people are constantly contacting us at Car Advice asking us for advice, funnily enough. Where do they go if they want to know what they should be buying? Mate, it's super easy. Advice at caradvice.com.au. Send us an email, yep. get in touch with us on social media and we will get back to you. Yep, don't be afraid. Now, I was sitting there with a mate the other day. He works in finance and he said to me, remember when people used to get, you know, $100,000 bonuses? And I went... No, 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 I don't. I've never had one of them. But anyway, assuming that you do get a hundred thousand dollar bonus, he wanted to know, and we started tossing it around as you would. What car would you buy if you could buy one under a hundred thousand dollars? This is so easy. Oh, because really? It's okay. just been released, and it fits the hundred k marker mm. perfectly. Okay. And by the way, my last bonus was spent on a chicken farm. <laughs> but my car was it on is discount is Wednesday yes, night special. Yeah. My car is the new BMW M2 Competition. Oh, I now, like your just, style. Yeah. yeah. Not just a standard M2. The mm. comp takes the engine out of the M3 and M4, mm. whacks it right into that little yeah. chassis, 
and it will be an absolute firecracker when it arrives in Australia. You so know, I, I think the M2 is actually currently the best value M car, yeah. I think, because M3, M4 have moved ahead a little bit and they're, they can be a bit unhinged, to be honest with yep. you, a little bit you. too powerful. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm clearly not a good enough driver. <laughs> but the M2, I reckon, is actually really good value and it makes a hell of a lot of sense. And from your 100 grand, you're getting 100 bucks change. $99,900, yeah, so it fits the bill perfectly mm -hmm. and I would love to have one in the garage. Okay, so for me, if you're a buyer who needs... Something practical, yes. because the M2 is not that practical, but you also enjoy your driving. Porsche Macan S, 95 okay. and a bit, plus on roads. So it falls under that $100,000 mark. But that's based on an Audi Q5, isn't it? Yes, but it's got Porsche badges. So they're worth <laughs> at least $10,000. The key looks good. And there's two of them, so that's twenty grand. Yeah, the key looks good as well. Now, I've got a question for you, yeah. Trent. Would you be able to buy that still if you had to tick some of the option boxes? Because yeah. everything is optional. Well, then it would be closer to $200,000, wasn't it? You want wheels, tyres, windows, then tick, tick, tick. Yeah, that's the problem. But I think what that does do, it, it still sets a standard for me of SUVs with a little bit of yep. sporting pretension. You yeah. can actually yep, yep. drive them. You can enjoy them. Uh, they're not boring, yeah. I suppose, yeah. is the okay. go. That you makes know? sense. But I, I still like the M2, but I, I don't know. I just... I think so many people are going to SUVs that, you know, it makes more sense to go to SUVs. So you're a sheep. Is what you're telling I feel us. comfortable with the flock, you know. Well, look, I'm happy with that. If you have other suggestions, yeah. advice at caradvice.com.au is where you can get in touch with us and let us know whether we're right or wrong. Mm. I'm clearly right, but I, I don't know <laughs> yeah. about yours. Well, you would need be. validation, don't you? Uh, that's all we've got time for tonight, so please join us again next week. And in the meantime, if there's anything you want to know about the world of new cars, go to caradvice.com and you will have all your questions answered.